Well, it's my real pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Taichi for his finishing talk. Uh, it's, it's a bittersweet time for an advisor. Uh, it's uh, bitter because I'm going to uh, miss having Taichi in the lab. I'm going to uh, miss being able to talk to you every day. Uh, it's sweet because I thought I'd never live to see this day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I thought long and hard about how to introduce Taiichi. Uh, and there's so many things I could say, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to begin. Taiichi is, um, he's, he's very motivated, he's a very curious individual. Uh, he, uh, he, he listens to his own, he follows his own uh, uh, drummer, I would say. He's somebody who uh, seeks out problems that are of interest uh, to him and, and, and thinks quite <coughs> independently, and this is a great thing uh, in, in science. Um, I, so in thinking about what to say, I, I thought I'd go back and look through some old emails. <laughs> it's, it's conventional for an advisor to give his student a hard time <laughs> the, when he introduces him to, for, for his uh, finishing talk. And I found what I think uh, is the first email I received from Taiichi ten years ago uh, when he was a student in, in Japan. He was a senior. Uh, and he wrote to me, uh, at, I was at the University of Arizona at the time, saying, I'm planning to visit Biosphere 2 this month. Now, for those of you that don't know, Biosphere 2 was this sort of boondoggle uh, in the desert. It was this giant, uh, uh, it was basically a, 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 like a terrarium that was constructed uh, in, in, in the desert to house uh, astronauts or people who might one day be astronauts. It was an experiment where they shut people inside uh, for two years, uh, I think it was eight, eight people, uh, with no access to, to the outside, and it was it was meant to sort of simulate what it would be like to uh, to live on Mars uh, for a period of time. And so I thought, well, you know, this is interesting. A student coming from Japan who wants to visit uh, Biosphere 2, and then later he mentioned something about wild house mice, and, and he'd like to visit me. Uh, and <laughs> so I was on sabbatical, and I wrote. I was in Germany, I think, at the time, and I wrote, wrote back and, and, uh, and said, uh, I'm not going to be there, I'm sorry I won't be able to meet you. Uh, and he, he wrote back and he said, my dream is to make a closed, sustainable, ecological system in space. <laughs> exactly what he worked on. Like the biosphere, uh, too. Uh, to, and then, you know, Taiichi's always been someone who's very detail-oriented. He thinks things through. And, he, and he, he said, to build a sustainable ecosystem, I think there are three main factors that we have to consider. Climate control, smooth material circulation, and genetic stability. <laughs> and uh, so I wrote back and said something like, well, that's all fine and good, but I'm a mouse geneticist. <laughs> and anyway, I'm in, I'm in Germany, and, uh, and, and so I, I won't be able to, to meet you. And I'm not going to read through all the emails because it would, it would take too long. But he, he wrote back and he, and he said, basically, well, that's all right. I'm coming to Arizona anyway, and I'll meet with the members of your lab. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, I was thinking, this guy's kind of pushy. <laughs> but but, he, but he, you know, he had what I look for in students, which is real grit and determination. He, he had something he wanted to, to do. So, so he came to Arizona, and I guess you looked at Biosphere 2. I never asked you about that. Um, but he visited the lab, and he met with everyone. And, and then after meeting with everyone, he, he, um, he wrote that uh, he had become interested. After my visit, I got interested in ecological genetics. <laughs> uh, and then he said also, I left some papers on your desk, uh, which I hope you can take a look at. <laughs> So, you know, even then he was giving me assignments, <laughs> and, and, and it, it, hasn't, it hasn't stopped. So, I, I uh, at that point, uh, had a phone call from Germany with uh, Nancy Moran, who was a great colleague uh, on the faculty there, and she said, hey, you know, this student Taichi came by, and uh, uh, he seemed really enthusiastic, and uh, he seemed all right. And I said, well, I don't like to accept students if I can't meet them face to face. And, but then I said, okay, uh, I'll accept him as a master's student. So Taiichi came and he started and he did a master's with me. 
And he, uh, he worked on the genetic basis of reproductive isolation in house mice. Mice have been studied from the perspective of hybrid male sterility for a long time, for decades. It's probably the best model system uh, for reproductive isolation in mammals. Uh, but Taichi worked on female uh, sterility, and this was a completely overlooked aspect of, of uh, this system. And he published a lovely paper on this in, in evolution uh, from his work on his master's. But then Taichi being Taichi, he wanted to continue for his PhD, and, uh, and he said, you know, I don't want to keep working on hybrid sterility, I want to work on microbiomes. Uh, and I said, well, that's fine, but I don't know anything about microbiomes. Uh, but I was at least happy that he wasn't interested in, in continuing working on the, on the biosphere. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, and, and the rest has been, has been history. He's done tremendous work. He's, he's brought this work uh, to my lab. He's taught me about microbiomes. Uh, his thesis has six chapters, three of which are published and three of which are basically ready to be submitted uh, for publication. Uh, he has a postdoc lined up to work with Ruth Lay at the Max Planck Institute in Germany when he leaves here uh, next month. So he's just been an, an exemplary student uh, in every way. But I want to just uh, close with a couple more emails that are uh, more recent emails. So Taichi did a, a heroic amount of field work as part of his, uh, his PhD thesis. Uh, in across two continents, uh, and one of these uh, trips was an uh, altitudinal transect in the Andes. Uh, so he went uh, uh, with a postdoc from the lab uh, to Bolivia and sampled mice from sea level up to over 3,000 meters. Um, and uh, Taichi, being detail oriented and, uh, and, and and very helpful, sent me regular updates. <laughs> uh, and so. I will just read a few of those uh, to you. The first one is uh, from August 10th, 2014. Hi, Michael. We are alive. <laughs> Here are some updates from the field. We caught the first mus this morning at uh, 3,300 uh, meters elevation. We also caught Acodon and Oligorhizomys, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that was August 10th. August 16th. Hi, Michael. We collected mus from 12 localities in La Paz so far. Uh, altitude of the locations ended up being continuous up to 3,800 meters. Blah, 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 blah. Lots of success. So that was a, a few days later. A few, later, uh, few days after that, August 21. Uh, quick update. We are doing well in Cochabamba. It gives me the altitudes, the number of mice we caught. Uh, and I'm thinking, boy, this is going great. August 25th. Uh, we're writing to you from Santa Cruz. Uh, we had a very successful trapping in Cochabamba with 13 locations in four nights. Blah, 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 blah. This was just fantastic. Better than field work uh, ever goes. And then on August 28th, I got this email. <laughs> Hi, Michael. <laughs> we had some troubles. <laughs> <laughs> and this is plural, not singular. <laughs> and, he, and he outlines them by number. One, a truck hit our car yesterday. <laughs> we had to pay $800. Blah, 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 blah. Two, we got stopped by the police yesterday, <laughs> the same day as the accident. He explains the situation and then says, but the police did not listen. <laughs> and we had to leave the car in front of the police. All of our efforts to work with the Bolivian police did not work. <laughs> so that was number, number two. Three, we are only getting rats. <laughs> and four, Although we both brought $2,000, we're running out of cash. <laughs> Can you send some? <laughs> and then he gives me a summary. So things went, went downhill, and I thought, well, gee, you know, what, how are we going to get out of this? And then two days later, I get another email from Taiichi, who manages to find a way out of every situation. Hi, Michael. Good news. I talked to the Japanese people here in Bolivia, and they made friends, and they helped them out, and it all ended happily. <laughs> so uh, that illustrates the, the last thing I want to say about Taiichi, which, which is that he's one of the nicest people you could ever hope to meet. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, in, in the lab uh, all these years, and um, I look forward to watching your career flourish as you go forward. So with that, I turn it over to him. I've taken too much time, but uh, I'm sure we're going to hear a, a lot of lovely things about the ecology and evolution of the gut microbiome. Thank you.
you, Michael, for that very nice introduction. And, and thank you all for coming. You know, this means a lot to me. This is pretty amazing. And so I, I know Michael, too, a lot for a while. So I'd like to share Michael's story. <laughs> and, and we didn't plan this, OK? I promise, we didn't plan this. This is my first email that I sent. <laughs> so basically, it's all what Michael said. But it's pretty embarrassing. I embellished a little. <laughs> it's embarrassing to read now because, you know, for example, I'm impressed by your ecological and genetic viewpoints and adaptive I have no ideas about population uh, genetics and So very naive. Bold, but these cold emails sometimes work. So. <laughs> Look at this time, it's only six minutes later. And it's it's all the same story. So and, and he actually corresponded by email for over a year on my undergrad thesis. So he, he advised someone that, uh, you know, just a random undergrad in the other side of the world he never met and he got advice for a year. So that's something about Michael. And over the years, I accumulated some Michael Mackey. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the most famous one is this one. You can see <laughs> so he has yeah. high expectations. And and he's a fan of hard working, and, and I am too. But sometimes you have to be honest. And, and you know, you need to see. <laughs> I like this one too. Um, your name is a brand. So if you know Michael, um, he's a perfectionist. Um, so if you go to his office, all the papers are stacked and organized. If you go to the field, all the traps are organized. You have to count you know, twice, triple times. And, here he's trying to check every single crack if the mice will, you know, to avoid the mice to escape. And when you write a paper with him together, it's even more intense. Um, so to, to meet his um, high quality perfectionist in you know, the it's pretty challenging. So you, we, we go through um, revision after revision, and that, you know, I learned a lot from that process. And, but if he said this in a meeting, it's a bad sign, because that means you, know, you should do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great teacher, too. So I taught, um, I TA'd his mammalogy class multiple times in Arizona. And he announced this in class. So our class was ranked the second uh, most difficult class at U of A. So this is including all <laughs> classes across all departments. So I remember including, um, so the list included, like, um, what was it? Electromagnetics, or like old English, or like theater. <laughs> and, and my mom's was still second. And of course, he's happy about this. So, so let's have a midterm tomorrow to get the first place. <laughs> that's, that's not funny. <laughs> you can see students' eyes that you just smile. <laughs> but the students love this course. So this is like IB 104 here, that it, it really changes people's life and career. And, and, and I was one of them too. This is my favorite class that I took in my life. So, so he uses um, some examples from like chemistry, physics, and all fields of biology to try to understand the cause of evolution of animals. And this was one of my um, eye-opening moments. And this is my last quote um, from him. So when I'm at work, I'm like a boy in a candy store, and, and I love what I'm doing. So he said this at the very first lecture in Bio 1B, in a big lecture hall in front of 800 students. And you know, maybe for this audience, maybe this is not special, but you know, there's not many people that can say this in a true way, right? And, and he likes what he's doing. And you know, like um, any jobs out there, you know, there are parts of the job that you don't like, right, as a human. But he, you know, he never complained about his work in front of me, and he's always excited about science. And that, that kind of um, professional um, attitude and um, that, the dedication to science and education really um, shaped um, <coughs> me as a scientist. So um, I'd like to thank Michael for being a great advisor. Um, and also, I was fortunate to have not only a good advisor, but great lab mates. So, <laughs> I can't thank them enough. Um, I won't be standing here really um, without their help. So they gave me all kinds of support. So like scientific support, so say all the stuff I'll be talking today went through the brain of these people and got criticized, um, polished, and got ideas. And 
and as English as my second language, you know, they had to read through a lot of my terrible English. They edited for all my manuscripts, all my you know fellowship applications, even important emails. But uh, most importantly, um, whenever I had you know difficult times in my life throughout these years, they were, you know, they were always there to um, support me. And that you know that feeling or that that kind of family-like feeling is very special, and, and that goes way beyond you know, more and more academic relationships. So. Thank you guys for the night from that, and I'm, I'm very, um, I feel very lucky and also proud to be uh, this member. Um, and this you know, um, same thing goes to the MBZ community as well, because um, just having this supportive environment um, by the staff and traders and grad students, postdoc, it, it, it really makes a difference as a work environment. And I appreciate your support. So. <laughs> We can end here, but I think we should end talking about science too. So Michael describes, I'll, um, I'll touch on all chapters, but um, I'll mainly focus on the last three chapters um, that's not published. So first I'll provide a background information to motivate my work, and then I'll talk about two st um, stories. One about gut microbiota in high altitude environments, and also gut microbiota in bird. So, so recent studies have discovered these um, un, um, previously unknown role of gut microbiome in host health. So for example, microbes are involved in digestion, so microbes can be a cause of obesity in some situations. And microbes <coughs> are involved in immunity, so we know <coughs> maternal transmission of the bacteria is important uh, to, to develop our uh, normal immune system. And also microbes can affect our behavior, like our mood, nervousness, and like, um, autism-like behaviors, and these has been replicated. So, so most of these studies come from um, model organisms and humans, so, so why should we care, right, as MBZ? And we should care because microbiome do affect fitness um, in vertebrates. So this idea that how bacteria can be beneficial to host fitness is not new. So this has been known from, you know, back in the 1800s, we already knew that um, bacteria fermentation is in, um, critical for um, digesting plant material. But, but what really changed in the past 10 years is this um, advancement of sequencing technology. So now we can characterize the entire microbial composition. And we can even compare um, the foregut of the cow to a crop of a Watson, which is an herbivorous bird. And their microbial composition is more similar to each other to them, <coughs> than to their own hind <coughs> So that's a convergence on the function of plant digestion. And those <coughs> pattern has been found in um, um, anteating mammals. Great and that work, I think, it's best described in whales. That they also have chitin-rich diet, and if you look at their metagenome, they're enriched in chitin degradation pathway. And I think one of the best examples in the field that, that showed how bacteria can be beneficial to the host is this um, wood rat system. There's a series of work done by Kevin Cole and Denise Deering showing how microbiome can detoxify these plant secondary com um, compounds, like the plant toxins. And that can be even transferred to lab rats by people transferring. And um, like the chytrid fungus and amphibians, and like the white node syndrome in bats, um, you know, those are important issues in conservation. And now people are finding these skin bacteria that have antifungal effects that can protect the host from pathogens. And there are also connections between bacteria and behavior. So bacteria in the scent glands have been studied. And there's some experimental evidence showing that can affect the behavior at mandus and, and guinea pigs. So, so I hope I convince you that you know, microbiome can be important but what we don't know is what, what factors are structuring, uh, structuring the gut microbiome community. So the, the determinants of the microbiome is unknown in, in, or less studied in natural populations. And also, uh, what is the role of this microbiome in host ecology? In <coughs> so I have two aims in my dissertation. So one is to identify these environmental genetic factors that, um, that associates with the microbiota. And also to um, try to understand the role of microbiome adaptation. So we know a little bit about the determinants of the gut microbiota in natural populations, and the best example is in humans. So we know diet, birth mode, breastfeeding, host genotype, disease, aging, and all factors do associate with the composition. But one issue is that all these things co-vary. Right? So this is one of the landmark papers looking how Western life cycle can affect the microbial composition. So this is a PCA plot, um, Bray Curtis dissimilar, ah, sorry, um, beta diversity. So each dot is individual. <coughs> similar the dots are, they have similar microbiome. So they're color-coded by US individuals, 
Malawians and Venezuelans living in rural area. So if you compare their lifestyle, lifestyle they are different. They are eating more high fiber diet, low fat diet. They tend to eat more high fat, low fiber diet. And this is from Noel's um, <coughs> mac and cheese party. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, diet differs, but also you know their house is more connected to the outside. Genotypes are different. Climates are different. Parasites are different. So it's very hard to disentangle these factors. But what's driving this pattern? So the common thing to do in human microbiome research is to take human microbiome and put it into lab mice and do experiments in more controlled environment. There's one issue because there there are whole specific bacteria like <coughs> Andy Moeller, you know, discovered too. So the, the results may not necessarily translate between systems. So just merely describing the pattern in field or just doing experiments in model organisms, maybe not enough to really you know to identify these determinants. So we need a system that can combine both approaches in a single system. And, and wild house mice provide a great opportunity to do this, to combine these both methods in, methods in a single system. So, so they originated in like Southeast Asia, and they spread all across the world. So now, we can, so now we can test the influence of wide range of genetic and environmental factors on the microbiome. And also, these are the same species of lab mice. So, so we have a lot of knowledge tools from microbial ecology and genetics and genomics. So uh, we can do the experiments in a single system. So we collected these house mice across the Americas um, as a lab. Um, this is part of a larger project in the lab. We're studying um, genetic bases of environment adaptation. So we have 26 populations that's shown in orange. Um, about 10 individuals per population, so five males, five females. And we have also live populations from the yellow dots. And I also sequence the 16S ribosomal gene as a marker to try to um, characterize the microbial composition. And I'm not going to go into the details of the method, but the idea is that the sequence identity of this marker gene will be assigned to different <coughs> bacterial taxa, and the abundance of the read will be the um, abundance of the bacteria. And we also generated um, <coughs> data for the mouse, and we have carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes from mouse hair to try to represent the diet. So, of course, I didn't collect all these samples. Um, so, Felipe Martins was a previous postdoc in the lab that collected the Ecuador transect. And Felipe and I collected the Bolivia Brazil transect. So, so, these are commensal animals. So, they live, you know, they live in <coughs> people's houses. So, you knock people's door and ask permission to set traps. And this was the Japanese <laughs> family that, that Mike was mentioning. Um, I want to I thank all the people who really um, helped you know, helped us with this because it's very, it's impossible to do this collection without their help. And they actually picked us up, so we lost our rental car, we lost our money um, for unfortunate reasons. But they, they, you know, they fed us, they let us stay at their house, they drove us around to set traps. So we <laughs> thank the Palestinian family. <coughs> and also, same thing for the latitudinal transects. So Megan Pfeiffer Rixi collected samples from the East Coast of North America, Felipe collected from South America, and I collected the West Coast. and. Dana and Felipe helped me collect from Canada. Same thing, I'd like to thank all the people who were involved in this collection trip. So, you know, this is an urban field trip, so you might be wondering, this must be easy, right? So, and, you know, I want to convince you that there's some parallels with the real expedition, like in Indonesia or Africa. So, for example, I drove almost 10,000 miles in two months in the West Coast. So that's about going back and forth. <laughs> That's an okay distance. <laughs> and I collected more than 1,000 specimens. So, um, well, maybe if Jim Patton's here, then this number is nothing. But it's, it's, a, it's a number. And we also discover new species of bacteria. So, so we get to name some species, Neisseria musculi, in a collaboration with Nathan Wayand. So he was at Arizona, but now he's at Ohio University. And it's still preliminary, but we have first evidence of um, multi lactobacillus in mice. So this is a collaboration in, with Dr. Kajikawa at Tokyo University of, of Agriculture. So there's, it's less exciting than new species of vertebrates, but <laughs> still some parallels. So that's the background, and I'd like to move on to the first story about microbiome and high altitude environments. <coughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> So high altitude environment is pretty challenging. And, and one reason is the inefficient amount of oxygen. And 
it's a physiological state called hypoxia. <coughs> so one of the highest sites that we have is in La Paz, Bolivia. That's about um, 50 to 60 percent of oxygen compared to sea level. So the um, animals have to compensate this inefficient oxygen somehow. And there, and, and there are a lot of physiological response. And, and one of them is to narrow the blood vessels and increase the blood pressure and increase the rate of oxygen carrying blood to tissues. And this is um, found in birds and mammals. If you move, move them from lowland to high altitude, this is the kind of response that people observe. So this is like a, um, an acclimation or plastic response. Um, and the genetic response is pretty complex. But for example, the um, Tibetans that we think they're um, adapted to high altitude have a minimal increase in blood pressure. But um, when they're doing exercise or doing pregnancy, they actually have greater amounts of um, um, greater blood pressure than the um, sea level population. So this increase in blood pressure has been associated with both plastic and adaptive response to high altitude. And one exciting discovery <coughs> recently is this how gut microbiome can regulate blood pressure. <laughs> so, so this idea is that um, so bacterial fermentation produces short chain fatty acid, and that circulates the blood, um, circulates the blood and, and based on the receptor, it can increase or decrease the blood pressure. And we also have some expectations why microbiome might change by atmospheric, atmospheric oxygen levels. So I looked at different parts of the GI tract in wild mice for a different study. And, and the oxygen decreases from mouth, mouth to anus. So you, you see in more oxygen-rich upper GI tract, you tend to see more aerobic bacteria. And you see more anaerobes and high blood. The same pattern is true if you make a section here, and if you look at the radial gradient of oxygen, the mucosal surface are the oxygen-rich area, where the oxygen diffuses from the blood to the gut. And in the middle, the, the center of the gut is more anaerobic. And, and you see the similar pattern. So you know, one might expect if you go to high altitude, there's less oxygen. So you might find an increase in anaerobes and decrease in anaerobes. And, and, and that haven't tested. So first, I would like to ask how altitude might have an effect on the gut microbiota. And then I'll like to ask <coughs> a specific hypothesis on how, um, how um, anaerobes increase and um, aerobes decrease with altitude. And then at the end, I would like to look at the um, functions of the microbiome that's enriched in high altitude environments. So this is the sampling design. So each bar represents an individual mice. Um, so we have two altitude of transects that's ranging from zero meter to almost um, 3,000 to 4,000 meter location. So if you make that PCA plot of the um, beta diversity, um, there's a significant clustering by population. So this color corresponds to the population. And if you color code this by altitude, um, you also see a significant association. So, so overall differences in the microbiome can be explained by these factors, but also there's diet effects, um, body mass, and they all co-vary. So you can do a model comparisons, um, including all those metadata. I'm not going to tell you the details, but the full model includes diet, um, <coughs> body size, um, reproductive status, sex. And, and that, that's the full model. And I'm comparing the full model to a model <coughs> of without altitude. So y-axis is just how good the model is. And this is just the major principal components of this microbial measurement. So you can see that. If you exclude altitude, um, the model gets worse um, than all PCs. And PC two and three is significant. So, so this result suggests that altitude have an independent effect on the gut microbiome, taking into account other co-variants. So altitude seems to have an effect on the, micro, the overall variation in the microbiome. So now I'd like to test this um, hypothesis. So, so you can categorize these bacteria genera into different um, oxygen requirement types using um, Burgess manual and, and recent literature. So, for example, the obligate anaerobes cannot live under oxygen. Um, and in contrast, obligate aerobes um, require oxygen to survive. And there's um, um, intermediates between them. So you can categorize into two um, anaerobes that cannot live under oxygen and aerobes that can live under oxygen. So if you do this categorization, any, can, any uh, look for a correlation with altitude, and you see a pattern that's consistent with the oxygen requirement. So these are all bacterial genera that show consistent correlation with the altitude in both transects. So all the bars facing on the right side 
it has positive correlation with altitude. All the bars on the left have negative correlation with altitude. And the color corresponds to different transects, and the shading of the color corresponds to oxygen requirements. So you can see all the positively correlated um, bacterial genera <laughs> are anaerobes, and most of the negatively correlated bacteria are aerobes, which you expect. And this pattern is significant. And, and you can um, look at the individual correlation. Um, so you can calculate the p value for each transect, and you can combine them using Fisher's combined p value. And all the significant ones are shown in the right direction. So for example, um, Acromenzia, so this is a mucin degrader. So they live in the mucus layer, which is oxygen rich. So it, it makes sense that there might be a greater niche or habitat for them in lower altitudes. In, the, in contrast, these are obligate anaerobes, um, Trevotella. So if you plot them on a figure, looks like this. So in each transect independently, if you go above 2,000 or 2,500 meters, you see this increase in the And then if you look at other studies, like in PICAs, you see a similar pattern. So they, they also looked at the soil and the diet microbial community, and, and they're not, um, on, so this correlation is independent of soil or diet. And similar pattern have been observed in cattle, sheep, and also in humans. So this study, they looked at Tibetans and Han Chinese at different elevations, but they also compared these two populations in, at the same altitude. And, and you still see this pattern. And the most striking study is this one. That, um, this is studying a lab mouse model for sleep apnea. So if you put the mice in hypoxic condition, you see this increase in prevalence. So, so it's interesting that you see across mammals, you see um, increase in prevalence in high altitude. So overall, this, um, this oxygen requirement of bacteria was predicted by altitude, and we see this enrichment <coughs> of prevotella in high altitude branches. So now I want to move on to the function, um, the predicted function of the microbiome. So you can do the same thing by um, predicting the gene fun function using the 16S data. So I used a program called PyPress. So what it does is you use the 16S gene, the marker gene, and you can predict the rest of the genome by database. Then you can um, categorize it into keg pathways. So if you do this, there's um, almost 180 keg pathways that are identified. And these are the ones that show um, a significant correlation of altitude. Um, but if you correct for multiple testing, only uranium angiotensin system is significant. So what is this pathway? So uranium angiotensin system is one of the key <coughs> pathways to increase the blood pressure. Um, so by renin and angiotensin converting enzymes have these cascade effects of narrowing the blood vessel and producing hormones to increase the blood pressure. But this is, first it was a little strange, right? Because this is predicted by the bacterial data, the 16S data. And it's predicting a host pathway. So first I thought this might be due to this, this known pathway where short chain fatty acid can mediate the renin release. And that's why maybe bacterial genes in production of short-chain fatty acid might be involved in this renin angiotensin pathway. But when you look at the actual bacterial gene, genes that was predicted, um, these are actually homologs of this um, vertebrate renin angiotensin system. So there's <coughs> a multiple papers describing these ACEs. Um, their structures are really similar to vertebrates. So uh, people even suggested that this must be due to horizontal gene transfer. And more surprisingly, uh, bacterial ACE can convert the mammalian angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 in vitro. So this suggests the noble hypothesis that it's not just the short-chain fatty acid affecting the renin release, but also the bacterial ACE may have a direct effect on the host uh, on vertebrate renin angiotensin. So, we saw this enrichment in renin angiotensin pathway in high altitude environment. So just to put this together, uh, we can generate a hypothesis <coughs> that how microbiome can be playing a role in blood pressure regulation in high altitude. So I'll walk you through this. So if you compare the high altitude mice to low altitude mice, high altitude mice are experiencing less oxygen, so that might increase the anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic fermentation produces short chain fatty acids. And we saw the enrichment of Prevotella, and that's also consistent. So Prevotella-dominant communities tend to produce greater short-chain fatty acid. 
So that can in turn um, increase the renin, it can affect the blood pressure. And another pathway is by this um, bacterial ACDs that can affect this. So it's still um, speculation, but I think it's a novel and um, interesting hypothesis. So that was the first story. <coughs> so move on to the second. So, so Bergman's role is just the observation that you tend to see larger body size animals in colder <coughs> and high latitudes compared to low latitudes in, in closely related species or something extended to within species. So for example, like in humans, um, it's, it's generally accepted that um, indigenous populations living in colder places tend to be heavier than in populations living at low altitudes. And, and we think this is reflecting thermal, um, thermal regulatory adaptation. So bigger body size, um, better at maintaining heat. So when you look at geographic variation of human microbiome, um, you see this pattern that's consistent with Bergman's role. So this study was based on um, these lab experiments <coughs> by Jeff Gordon's group, that in, in um, humans and mice, um, obese individuals were associated with greater fermentudes and less bacteroidetes. And this, this has been shown to play a causal role um, in some experiments. So if you look at across, so, so this is a meta-analysis um, using six studies, and you can see more obesity associated composition is more common in, in higher latitudes than lower latitudes. But this, so, so this pattern was not explained by the method used or sex or age, but this can be due to any factors that vary with latitude. So it can be diet or cultural difference. So I'd like to test this idea that how microbiome may play a role in this um, climatic adaptation in mice. So first I'd like to ask if there's evidence of Bergman's role in wild house mice. And then I'd like to ask if gut microbiota is associated with these potentially adaptive differences in body mass. And then I'd like to know if there's genetic basis to gut microbial variation. So just to remind you the sampling design, we have three latitudinal transects. So east coast of North America, west coast, and South America. And all these black dots are the live columns that collected, maintaining in this building. So if you just plot the average body weight, and the, the pattern is consistent with Bergman's so rule. some outliers, you see a general pattern. And if you look at individual transects separately, um, only East Coast of North America is significant, and other two are not. And if you look at these two pop, uh, three populations, in New York, Florida, and Brazil, um, they show a nice climb. If you bring this back to the lab, um, that body size difference persists. And, and we confirmed this for a later generation by our lab, but also by Carol Lynch in 1990. So overall, I think we can conclude that, yes, overall, it's <coughs> consistent with Bergman's rule, but especially in the East Coast of North America, the pattern is robust. So now I'd like to see if there's any link between microbiota and body mass. <coughs> So if you make the same PCA plot, um, there's a huge effect of geography. So it's kind of mimicking the map. It's surprising. So this is South America samples. These are Brazil samples, Argentina, and this is North American samples. So there's effect of geographic distance. But when you color code this by BMI, which is just a body weight divided by body length, squared, um, you, you see that BMI can also explain this pattern. And you might notice that if you compare these two figures, um, North American mice are heavier than South American mice. So these two variables are co-varied. So you can look at individual transects separately. And, <coughs> and so now I'm controlling for geographic distance and looking within the East Coast of North America. BMI remains significant using partial compass. Same thing for the West Coast. Body weight remains significant, controlling for geographic distance. But in South America, um, the body mass don't correlate with overall difference in microbiome. So overall, it seems like North American samples um, have association between microbiome and body mass. And this pattern was true for alpha diversity. So this is looking at species richness. So we're using a measure called phylogenetic diversity. So larger mice tend to have more species rich communities. In North American transects, but not in South America. So if you combine these together, um, the correlation is significant. And when you bring this back to the lab, um, 
it's, it's even a little stronger. So, so this suggests that this correlation is not just driven by the environmental factors. So this pattern has been shown in other studies and by um, interspecific com um, comparisons in animals. But we don't really know why we see this pattern. And I can um, think of two reasons. Um, and one can be species area relationship. So larger mice may provide greater, greater area for the bacteria to colonize. Just simply, big, bigger body mass can attract, um, can um, attract or see more rare or to use. And other explanation is uh, maybe species-rich communities have a function. So species-rich communities may be important for plant digestion. So if you look at um, for, um, the fermentation chamber, it has the highest alpha diversity compared to other gut segments, and also um, herbivorous mammals have the highest alpha diversity compared to omnivorous or carnivorous. So, so based on stability diversity relationship, species rich communities are more stable and can recover faster from disturbance. So maybe there are fun functions of having high alpha diversity. So so far I told you it's just a connection between compositional variation in the microbiome and potentially adaptive body size variation. <coughs> but now I would like to ask whether the functional variation in the microbiome associates with body. So to do this, um, we measured short-chain fatty acid in these um, wild-derived lines in lab. So we have wild-derived inbred strains from Canada, New York, Florida, Arizona, and Brazil. And we, these are all males, and they were age-matched. <coughs> and you can see the body size varies clinally. So mice from the colder place tend to be heavier. And this body size difference is not explained by food intake. So so maybe, you know, this suggests that maybe it's something to do with deficiency of energy. So when you measure the short-chain fatty acid, you see this pattern that mice from the colder place tend to produce greater amounts of short-chain fatty acid. And this was true for individual short-chain fatty acid as well. So um, acetate and propionate, butyrate, they all show a similar pattern. So, so this is consistent with the idea that mice living in colder place are larger, and also they're efficient at um, <coughs> energy extraction. So for the second part, we saw evidence of compositional and functional variation in the microbiome associated with these potentially adaptive differences in body mass. So just to go back, you know, if you if you focus on Florida and New York, which which showed the Bergman's row pattern, they, they differ in short chain fatty acid. So now I would like to focus on the East Coast samples and see if there's a genetic basis for <coughs> So first I tested whether the overall difference in the genome are associated with differences in the microbiota. So host genetic distance and geographic distance both correlate with microbial distance. Um, but these two also correlate to each other. So there's a pattern of isolation by distance within a population. So when you take the residuals of the right plot and plot it against host genetic distance, this correlation remains significant. If you do the opposite, um, this becomes non-significant. So this suggests that host genetic distance may be more important than geographic distance within a population um, the, the structure in the microbiome. So this was overall difference in, um, differences in the host genome. But now I, I would like to know which part of the genome is associated with microbial measurement. <coughs> so we ran a microbiome genome validation <coughs> study, so MGLOS, using 280,000 SNPs. 18 bacterial measurements, and we used a program called GEMMA, which we controlled for population structure, relatedness, latitude, and hidden factors. And we also corrected for false discovery. And we used a QGO of less than 0.01. So if you do this, um, we find 24 SNPs, um, including 20 genes that are associated with um, three bacterial measurements. So one is a lower bacter, bacterial diseases, and phylogenetic diversity, which was associated with that body mass variation. So if you look at this list, um, one gene stands out. So this interleukin-12a, this is a cytokine that correlated with relative abundance of odoribacter, and which included a SNP that has the lowest p-value across all 18 GWAS, and includes a three missense mutation. So if you make a Manhattan plot, so this is x-axis is the chromosome, y-axis is the p-value, 
and each dot is a SNP. So you can see this interleukin 12A gene um, stands out from the rest of the genome. And if you make a QQ plot to look for biases, uh, these top SNPs seem to be true signals. And these SNPs are not linked to other genes, so LD decays pretty quick. And then if you take a top SNP, which is non-synonymous, um, they have significant association with multiple elements of the vector, um, controlling for that. Moreover, if you look at the literature, in 2016, um, people have associated odorobacter and cytokine, um, including interleukin 12A. So th this is a great candidate gene that we um, uh, <coughs> follow up. And since we see this overlap with my data in mouse and humans, um, I thought um, we should look for overlap between mouse MG loss and human MG loss. So I lowered the threshold a little bit to increase the power to have almost 100 candidate genes for mice. And I collected candidate genes from human MGOS using seven published studies. So if you look for the overlap, there are eight genes that overlap between the two. And all eight genes were expressed in the brain in mice and humans. And genes included obesity and immunity related genes. And what was most surprising is that this overlap is significant. So meaning that there's a total number of um, of human mouse ortholog is like 19,000 genes. So if you randomly pull 96 genes and 469 genes, and having eight overlap is pretty rare. So, mm -hmm. so this is surprising. It, it kind of suggests this exciting hypothesis that how and you know, there might be general genetic mechanism that governs this microbial composition. So that was the last part. So we see evidence of how host genetic, uh, host genetics associated with. So if you put this together, um, we can come up with this hypothesis that how microbiome can be playing, you know, potentially playing a role in this term regulatory adaptation. So at least in the East Coast, um, we saw the New York mice was heavier than Florida mice. And there are some immune genes that were associated with um, microbiome variation. And microbiome from colder places produced, produced greater amounts of short-chain fatty acid, which in turn cannot be provided mass. So, uh, we need more work to really um, tease, apart, um, tease apart the causation, but at least this provides an exciting hypothesis how microbiome may be playing a role in, in, in Bergman's role, which is um, a <coughs> classic um, evolutionary pattern. So that's the two stories. And in conclusion, um, so we found atmospheric oxygen levels, body mass, and immune genes seem to be important determinants of wild mice. And the production of stretching fatty acid by the bacteria may serve as a um, signaling molecule and energy source that can mediate adaptation to high altitude and high latitude environments. So for that, I would like to thank all the people who were involved in my dissertation. So Wayne, Susan, and Mary is, I think, here today. That was my dissertation committee and all the people who helped me with the mice collection, and people who helped me to generate the molecular data and analysis. And a lot of people um, gave me comments and feedback on the dissertation. And a lot of undergrads were involved um, in this project, and mostly the dissection center, and James here. And, and my family couldn't come, but um, I think they'll send this video. So <laughs> thank you my family and my undergrad advisor, and, I'll, and also the MDC. Thank you so much, and I'll be fine. Before we start uh, questions, I just wanted to say uh, Taichi's going to have a committee meeting immediately after this, and he teaches at 2 o'clock, but at 1.45 we're going to have a little champagne in here, and you're all welcome. To <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Yeah. Hey, why don't you call him? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, great job here. Let me say that first. I can't help myself. But uh, it seems like this lays a great context for thinking about uh, pathogens in the beginning to at least. And
and I like so much looking at vertebrates instead of uh, you know humans and house mice, a world I've been sadly you know connected to somewhat. And so uh, I wonder if you've done any thought about the idea of thinking about pathogens, things that burst out of the microbiome and cause a lot of trouble for the population. And you know it's so nice to have. As I say, people get confused and snarled in their heads when you're talking about humans. And I think people in MPC, that happens to them when they look at vertebrates, but I hope a little bit less, at least, you know, a little bit clearer <coughs> image of what we're, so you're, you have a few steps back and you can see more clearly. So I wonder if you've thought about pathogens. Yeah, pathogens. So, so people have studied um, pathogens, so say the virus, the viral levels, um, and, and macroparasites too, and they have been shown to associate with difference in microbial composition in wild house mice from different studies. And, and we haven't really looked at it in our samples yet, um, but I have a, it's not a pathogen, but we have a collaboration with John Taylor that he looks at the fungal community, and we have those data as well. So I think, yes, so, so pathogen can be bacterial pathogens, but also just increasing virus and fungal community. Um, what does, do you know what does uh, interleukin-12 do, and do you have ideas about how it's uh, affecting the microbiome? Is it downstream to the SCFA? Is it upstream of the SCFA? Yeah, so they, so I should study more, but they're involved in um, innate and adaptive response, so, so they're um, involved in